Last time on the Rock Chuck Olympics, we set the stage for the event, we met each of the competitors, and we got a broad overview of each of the shooting stages. This time on the Rock Chuck Olympics, we go to the classroom to hear about products the competitors will use, and we learn from world-class competitors how to shoot in specific shooting disciplines. Then the competitors go to the top of the mountain to get familiar with their new firearms and get everything zeroed in. The 2023 Rock Chalk Olympics, sponsored by RCBS, celebrating 80 years of precision. DM Targets, quality steel targets built by shooters for shooters. Stag Arms, there is no weak side. Caldwell Shooting Products, Wheeler Gunsmithing Tools and Tipton Gun Cleaning Products. Good morning, John. Good morning, Gavin. This is it. It's finally here. Day one of the Rock Chuck Olympics. We're here, man. This is this is an absolutely incredible environment to kick this off. I am really excited, guys. The amount of knowledge just in this little area, in this little valley here, is impressive. What are we doing today? So this is going to be awesome. We're starting in the classroom. Okay. We're going to have competitive shooters teaching us shooting techniques. We're going to have sponsors showing us the gear that we're going to use to shoot with, to clean rifles, to do gunsmithing, all sorts of stuff. And then in the, in the afternoon, we're going to go up the hill. We're going to go to the shooting range and we're going to transition to hands-on training. So people are going to put their knowledge skills to the test. It's going to be a lot to take in, but We've got some of the world's best shooters, F-Class, PRS, Speed Steel. This is a ridiculous lineup, and I'm actually looking forward quite a bit to learning myself. You know, when you say the best shooters in the world, you're not, you know, a lot of guys just say, oh, yeah, it's the, it's the U.S. No, no, worldwide, some of the best. World right. champions, absolutely. The action is going to be intense, so let's go into the classroom and check it out. Let's do it. Justin Smith joined us from RCBS starting with an overview of RCBS's legacy of 80 years in business. So, tell us about RCBS, Justin. So, RCBS, uh, thanks Gavin, it's been around 80 years this year. I mean, 80th anniversary is kind of a, it's a big deal for us. You know, it's founded in 1943 by Fred Huntington and he was just looking for that void in the market to find quality varmint, varmint bullets and so. During World War II, I find that kind of interesting. You know, here was an open house in 1960 and you know, here's a great picture of Fred Huntington. Here's Jack O'Connor. Uh, here's the facility from 1954 when it first made. Mm -hmm. Here's how it's progressed in the early 1980s. And, mm -hmm. you know, this picture I took just a couple weeks ago when I was out there uh, doing a little R&D with the team. And mm -hmm. it's uh, certainly changed and getting yeah. ready for the future. Yeah, I, I know that a lot of people have grandpa's green press that they learned to load hunting ammo on, and it's really a, a, a big part of people's stories with shooting sports and with reloading and all that, so. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, that's kind of where the whole thing started was with the Rock Trucker Press. Mm. And so Summit, a little bit different than most presses out there. Most presses, you bring the, the brass up to the die. Mm -hmm. This here, we got a solid two inch ram, but now you're bringing the die down to the brass. Mm -hmm. When you drop that bullet in there, it just perfectly aligns it. Yeah, it's a popular press for people to take portable to the range, I've, I've noticed. There we go, a load of ammo. Thanks again, Justin. Thanks, Gavin. That was awesome. We had the opportunity to hear from Jared Grove and Scott Steyart about how to clean an AR-15. Like a few of the basic firearms handling rules apply while you're cleaning. So keep pointing in a safe direction and then verify that it's clear. Another thing that you might want to consider is uh, like eye protection or gloves. So mm -hmm. Some of that stuff is pretty nasty. So tools. You're going to need something like a, a cleaning rod. You could use a, a pull through cleaner. Anytime you clean a rifle, some sort of a bore guide is nice to keep that solvent from uh, getting in spots that you don't want it. And then another one that's kind of unique to the AR would be a carbon scraper. How often? Do you clean your ARs? If it's a precision rifle, I do kind of treat it like a bolt gun where I'm cleaning that barrel out mm -hmm. and worrying about that. If it's uh, more of the three gun or run and gun, um, I try to keep just clean enough that it keeps uh, <laughs> reliably cycling. Once the firearm is deemed safe, it's disassembly time. And then what I like to do is just, I'll just take it apart, you know, because it's an AR, it's pretty simple. And that's pretty much it. It's going to take the bolt apart here. Take out the firing pin, okay, and I'll just put that over here like that. Take the bolt out, put it in there so I don't lose it, and that's pretty much it. And then at this point, 
you know, it's nice to have a solvent tank. Jared highlighted the versatility of the AR-15 carbon scraper. Yeah, and so a carbon scraper will have like different radiuses to fit right into the, this is a really bad spot, like mm -hmm. on, on your tail. I'm mm -hmm. um, getting down in this part, that, that'll clean in there. That's it has nice. a spot for doing your firing pin right and scraping all your firing pin stuff off. So that has a whole lot of different uh, shaped scrapers into one little tool. One of the biggest questions, which parts of the bulk carrier group to oil and how much? I don't, I don't put a whole lot of oil on this. It, like once I get in there and again, I'll clean out the carbon. If I've, if I've taken it apart, make sure all the, all the carbon's out. But um, I'll just look at it and wherever there is like a wear spot on here, which is typically you know, one here, one here, one here, and one here. And I'll just put a light coat of grease on here like that. And that, that's really it. I'll put some solvent on a wet patch. I'll run it through there. And typically what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll run it through there and I'll set it aside and I'll let it just have like a few minutes to loosen up the carbon. Yep. Um, after I run it, the brush there, maybe like eight or 10 times, I'll get uh, another wet patch. I'll run it through there until it starts to clean up and then I'll use a dry patch and then I'm done. And then I'll put it all back together. I'll go back out to the range. And then once I know that it's, you know, it's zeroed, everything's on, I shoot a couple rounds, I put it back in my, in my bag and I'm ready to go. I know I'll be using some of these insights and these specific tools the next time I clean an AR-15. From Canik Firearms, I was joined by Adam Ranola, who gave us context about Canik as a company and also the SFX Rival S. Thank you, Adam, for coming, man. Thank you for having me, brother. This is the pistol for the Rock Chuck Olympics. What are we looking at here? This is the Canik SFX Rival S. Canik is one of those brands that literally came from a completely different space, and then they kind of bought this little gun shop <laughs> and saw something that could be what it is now. Not only are they small arms, but we have 50 cal machine guns. We have 20 and 30 millimeter cannons. We have robotic systems, housing systems. So this is a culmination of almost 2,000 people wow. that work for Canik across the globe, mm -hmm. uh, really coming in and saying, what are the expertise levels we have from all different looks at this, and how can we develop a pistol that we can all be proud of? And that is really kind of Canik's claim to fame. Other than the trigger, it's everything you get yeah. for the value. And that's something that was really important to me personally, to the entire team at Canik, and even to Nils Jonasson, obviously, that's here right now. He and I spent many, many a day in the Istanbul and Samsung offices in Turkey, literally designing this platform. Nils said, hey, I love this gun, but wouldn't it be cool if it could do this, or if it had this? And to the credit of those guys over there, they said, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> Every time was just, yeah, we could do that. And the entire gun can be assembled and disassembled in five minutes using only a Canik punch. Next came an awesome announcement. Competitors, what do you think? Do you, do you guys want one of these? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Are you looking forward to trying one of these? Okay, yeah. yeah. you're walking away with one of these and you get to compete with it. Oh, so sweet. yeah, how awesome That's is that? Great. Well, thank you very much, Adam, again. Ryan Donahue, General Manager at Stag Arms, gave an overview of new products for 2023 and the Stag Firearms used for this event. This is 20 years of Stag. So this mm -hmm. is our 20th anniversary that we are celebrating this year. Everything that you see, 100% US made. Sub MOA guarantee on everything that we make. So we have an infinite shot barrel guarantee. So nice. a little bit over five pounds out of the box. The coolest thing about these comps, they shoot flat, mm -hmm. but half of the cans that are in the industry, you can kind of direct thread right over top nice. of lightweight Hanson profile barrel. So that's what's given us the really lightweight features on here. Everything on the gun is again, made for the shooter by shooters. I was happy to announce what each competitor would get from Stag Arms. So do you guys like these? How much do you like these? A lot. Do you want to go home with one? Yeah. Done. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so this is the Stag Pursuit AR. Um, a lot of the features that we talked about on our Spectrum guns are in this rifle as well. So this AR is geared towards the hunting market. My favorite thing on the rifle is right back here. So Wyoming leather on the back with the Stag logo. You know, the cold mornings to have that on your face is way better than a plastic. Nobody has ever shot this before. This is our Stag Pursuit bolt action rifle. Stag does make bolt action rifles now. So this is in a Magpul chassis. Our version coming out with our chassis is very different than anything that you've seen. The biggest part on the chassis that you would see 
is the AR-10 takedown pin that's on the back. So that allows the gun to be taken down, make it into a smaller configuration. It also gives us the ability to say, if I can turn my gun, my AR, into crazy spectrum hunting gun, mm -hmm. why can't I customize this gun to what I want it to be for that day? Yeah. So Stag will have different pieces that come out, folding stocks, different setups that you'll see, but everything on the gun, again, customizable for the shooter. My favorite part about this gun is the bolt. Do you remember the Remington bolts and you could use uh, the shoelace trick? So I used to use the shoelace and you kind of looped it around and you put it on your foot and you use that as a tension piece to be able to get the bolt to come apart. So this is the way that our bolt comes apart now and then you can use the firing pin itself to pop out the lug here and then you've got yourself so you can swap out nice. for a magnum bolt face. Yeah. So everything that we've learned over the years from the AR we put into this gun. Well, thank you again, Ryan. Yeah, no problem. It was awesome. Oh, greasy hands. No problem. <laughs> Dustin Harding from Athlon gave us an overview of optics used for this event. Okay, it's time to talk optics. We got Dustin Harding from Athlon. Thanks, Dustin, for joining us. Yeah, and thanks for having me. I'm real excited to be here. You're a real precision-minded channel. We've got the Tylo CDC. This is kind of our entry level into um, carry optics. It's a composite chassis, 50,000 hours battery life fits on the RMSC footprint, the shield footprint. It's a real affordable optic, comes in right at 100 bucks. Um, it's a three MOA dot, so it's gonna really kind of help these guys on that precision shooting, really being able to dial in and focus on those longer shots that you've mm -hmm. got planned for them. Mm -hmm. We've topped off the ARs with the Talos 1 to 4. Again, kind of one, one of our entry level uh, LPVOs. This one's a 1 to 4. Uh, you guys are gonna be shooting with a mill reticle. So if you know your holds in mills, <laughs> perfect. Uh, that scope comes in right around 229 retail. And then the Helos BTR Gen 2. This is one of my favorite little optics. It's a 6 to 24. It has a precision zero stop, locking turrets, and a brand new optical system for us that rivals HD glass. It's got 100 MOA or 29 mils of adjustment. Mm -hmm. So if you want to stretch something out at you know, a real budget point, it's the optic. You can have the best gun on the market. You can have the best scope. But if your mating surface between the scope and the rifle is not there, if you don't have a, a good set of rings and a good mounting job there, mm -hmm. it's going gonna, it's gonna to go to pot. Torque specs aren't really dependent on the optic. Across the industry, you're going to see different wall thicknesses, different materials used. But when you're mounting an optic, it's really dependent on the screws in the mount. So I really recommend that when you go to mount your optic, look at your rings and go with their torque specs. Then I told each competitor what they would go home with from Athlon. You guys like these optics? Because <laughs> these are going home with the guns, so good news on all fronts. Long shot cameras have been an important part of capturing the Rock Chalk Olympics. Matt Hale joined us to give us some context. Matt Hale from Long Shot, thank you for being here. No, happy to be here. What we want to do with Long Shot is try and solve some problems. So when we think about time at the range, moving from your shooting position down to your target to really see where your progress is, especially if you're an instructor uh, working with somebody. Um, so we wanted to solve some of those problems. So we're essentially uh, a company that makes target cameras that help you see your shot without leaving your spot. You have a live video feed back to a phone or tablet using our long shot app where you're able to mark your shots, group size, um, and get live feedback of what you're actually doing. It's a pinch to zoom so you can actually see what you're doing on a close-up perspective. And there are even options to add multiple cameras that all tie in to your tablet so you can switch between different targets that you have set up. Eric Cortina is an expert with wind reading and long range shooting and competition. He shared some of his insights with the rest of the competitors and the audience. Thank you for joining us, bro. Thanks for having me. Let's talk about the EC tuner break and let's talk about Wind and Mirage, how about that? So what do we got here? Well, we have the EC Tuner Break. This is the next generation. We've learned a lot about tuners. You know, I've been shooting tuners for over a decade in competition. When I started shooting PRS, I put a tuner behind the brake mm -hmm. and people were like, oh, we never realized you could do that. So <laughs> then they said, you know, it'd be really nice if you could combine the two. So that's what I did. This is the next generation. The port design is a little more aggressive. It minimizes muscle jump and the tuner, it uses a spring, so it, it actually eliminates backlash. So t tell me about this whole barrel harmonics thing. We, we know barrel harmonics exist fundamentally, right? So when you shoot, your barrel's gonna vibrate. Mm -hmm. So 
this weight, which is what we call a tuner, you can shift it back and forth, and then you can tune the barrel to your load rather than tuning a load to the barrel. So why don't we talk about kind of some of the fundamentals of wind and mirage from an F-class champion like yourself? There's three ways that I read wind. The most reliable is your previous shot, because we all think we're going to hit the target on the first shot. If we missed it, you don't have to worry about why you missed. Right. Mill it, move over, and go. Yeah. Worry about the why later. Yeah. So now the first shot was absolute, the second one shot was relative. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's going to be the most reliable. Yep. If you don't have that, then <laughs> mirage is right. going to be the second. Yep. And the third is going to be wind flags or vegetation. Okay, so let's talk tricks now. The way I do it is I, I, I apply a value to the flags and hope that I'm right. And if I am correct, then I use the flag as a needle mm -hmm. on a gauge. And the background is my gauge face. Mm -hmm. So if the flag, if it's dipping and there's a tree in the, in the background and it's just hitting the tip of that tree, then I know that when the flag is touching there, it's the same. Mm -hmm. And I just go to my previous hold <laughs> and I've won many matches wow. with that trick. That's tricky. Also, the Mirage, if you're uh, at a thousand yards, mm -hmm. and it, it takes practice just like anything else, but you can literally look on the side of the spotting scope and then you can count one, two, three, four, five, and then you kind of stay with that spot, see how long it takes to travel mm -hmm. all the way across your scope. You, get, you can get really good at placing a value on that speed. <laughs> the easiest way to practice wind reading is don't hold off. Aim dead center. Okay. And number one is just figure out, is it going to go left, right, or center? And just hold that center and mm -hmm. see which way it went. Gotcha. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, you're welcome. Super awesome stuff. Yeah. Nils Jonasson is a world champion pistol shooter and a part of Team Canik. He was able to share some of his pistol fundamentals with the other shooters. Nils Jonasson, thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be here. You're here to tell us about how to shoot a pistol, how to get on target, and how to do it quickly. I am, and what better way to do it than pistol shooting fundamentals. And this is literally how simple pistol shooting is, all right? You got your sights, your grip, and your trigger. If you do those three things effectively, you're gonna hit the middle of the target. Trigger. What is the correct way to press the trigger? As fast as possible without moving the gun off target. Would you do that by pressing the trigger or slapping the trigger all the way through the full length of it? It, it depends, right? If you're not influencing the gun far enough off the target to miss the target, then either of those options work. So a short reset is awesome, and the Canik has one of the shortest resets in the industry. But if you're feeling for that break on the reset and actually taking time to do it, you're wasting time. How do you figure out if you're jerking the shot or pulling off target? When you line up at your sight and you press the trigger and the dot goes like this, mm -hmm. you did something wrong. So you need to correct something, whether it's the trigger press, your grip, um, one of those two things is influencing that sight moving. And that will actually lead us to our next slide, yeah, which sure. transitions to the grip fundamentals. And the main role of the grip, uh, one of them, is mitigating the effect of a bad trigger press. So if you have an awesome trigger press, you can grip the gun like this, and you're gonna have awesome accuracy. But if your trigger is influenced in any way, your grip can overcome that. But it starts with contact on the gun. So this pistol has an upswept uh, back of the frame here, and we wanna get as high on the back of the pistol as possible with our strong hand. Uh, you got your three fingers underneath the trigger guard. The SFX Rival S has a double undercut trigger guard that actually lets you get up a little bit higher on the pistol. The meat of your left thumb should fill this cavity as much as possible. And then I actually rest my strong thumb on top of that left side. So I get not only the contact from my right hand, I get a bunch of material from my left hand on the grip, but now I'm resting my thumb and pressing into my thumb from my strong hand, getting more grip that way. So say you pull the trigger perfectly, you know, you can get away with a lot with the grip, but if you're a little reckless with the trigger or you're just trying to shoot fast, a really solid grip will mitigate the influence your trigger has on the sights. So you wanna grip the gun and press the trigger almost on autopilot so you can give 100% of your focus to what you see. 
And by leaving my focus on the target, I am not only faster, but I'm more accurate. Nils, thank you so thank much. You. All right, so how about accuracy and speed together? Let's talk PRS. Peter Milan from Impact Shooting, thank you for making it down. So let's walk through it. The rifle system that we've got here is, you've got the Carbon X yeah. from APW as, as a completely independent person. Yeah. I'm sure that you're completely satisfied with it, right? Oh, for sure, yeah, I'm not biased at all. Um, <laughs> it's his company. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I do share it with a mate of mine. I do like that sort of hybrid system where it's like a bit of traditional with a bit of modularity. Obviously our barrel profiles are a little bit heavier. We're trying to add as much weight and while at the same time adding weight, trying to balance the rifle so it's easier to track with your follow-up shots and all of those kind of things. So it's so important when we're engaging these targets to see where we're missing, to be able to make a correction on that. And the weight helps a hell of a lot with that. Obviously running a good muzzle brake also makes a big difference, but there's many things sort of all packed into one. Yeah. So another thing with the heavier rifle, it moves a little bit less than what the guys are actually able to do. If you've ever stood behind somebody shooting and you're looking down your um, the, the sort of line of the bullet flight, where you can see the bullet flying with the binos. If you get highly proficient with shooting a bolt gun in positional shooting, especially if you're shooting a slower cartridge, you can actually see your own trace. Yeah. Because a lot of the time, a target will be like on a ridge, and if you're missing it, there's no dust kicking up because the bullet's hitting like three, 400 yards behind it yeah. down range. We have that problem in our thousand yard range right here. Yep. So <laughs> if you're able to see bullet trace and see that bullet arcing off the right of the target, you can make a correction based on that. How about building positions? This is a huge, huge part of PRS. Yeah. So I find this sort of medium style bag is the sweet spot for me. Sure. It's maneuverable enough, but it's stable enough. And whether we're using that as front support sometimes, if we're shooting off an obstacle like we will do when we go out to the range, we're using it as front support. If we're doing prone stuff like we have set up here, we're using it as a rear bag. And it's just the less stuff I have to manage while I'm on the clock, the better for me. So uh, time management, talk to me about what, what, what's going through your head in a stage. Shooter ready and then you, you know you have 90 seconds to hit no. multiple crazy targets. So usually by the time I shoot a stage, I have shot the stage a few times like in my head. I would run through like, okay, that's where that target is. That's where the next target is. I'm going to dial the following. We also manage our dope, which we'll chat about just now, which is basically like what do we need to dial for the next target. So there's so many things you have to manage while on the clock, and that's usually where the mistakes creep in, is you'll dial for the wrong shot, or you'll forget to dial, or like, there's so many things that can go wrong. So for me, and this is sort of what Nils was saying earlier too with the pistol shooting, the more proficient you become at something, the more bandwidth you can free up to think about things like, okay, what is the wind doing? Is it the same as it was just now? Is it, is it gusting a little bit more? Yeah. A proficient shooter, it won't look, like if you watch Null shoot a pistol, it'll look fast, but it looks smooth, you know, it'll, mm -hmm. it'll flow. Mm -hmm. And you'll see the same thing with the bolt action shooters. Like a proficient guy, it'll, they make it look easy. Thank you, Pete. Lovely. Looking forward Thanks to Thanks for having us. Awesome. The insights about these products and shooting disciplines really set the stage for the competitors to get hands-on with their firearms. This was what I was waiting for, the opportunity to show each of these competitors the ultimate Reloader Ranch in its entirety. Competitors and sponsors jumped into the side-by-sides and the Badlands Bronco to experience the ultimate Reloader Ridgeline Range and Road for the first time. This road is an experience. There's twists, turns, landings, switchbacks, and amazing sweeping vista views. Down the back side of the mountain, the entire crew assembled to experience these star arms for the first time. Well, John, that was quite a classroom session. It was, it was really, really intense. So much knowledge in there, multiple world champions. I can't think of a better way to kick this off. Yeah, I know I have a ton of homework. Pistol shooting, PRS shooting, wind calling. Like, I can't, I can't wait to dig into this stuff. And so the guys back here, we announced during the tech sessions that they're getting a Canik SFX Rival S handgun. Oh my gosh. With the Talos EDC red dot. They're also getting the Stag 16 inch Spectrum carbine. Some of them are 50 shades FDE. Some of them are 50 shades OD green. This and is I'm, some cool I'm stuff. I'm 50 shades of jealous, <laughs> you know? I'm just, this is, this is a complete package for these guys and I can't wait to see them really get into using it. Yes, so now's the time when they get to actually sight things in. They're gonna get a little bit of hands-on time with these handguns and these rifles to figure out what they feel like and how they shoot. Tomorrow is the big day. So this is their last chance to take what they learned and to do some tweaks and yeah, get, get it dialed in, man. Yeah, Get it dialed in because the real competition starts tomorrow.
That is gonna be awesome. Each competitor took their Spectrum rifle and made sure their Athlon 1-4 LPVO was properly zeroed at 100 yards for the coming competition. The competitors loved the way these pistols shot and took time to fine tune the red dot to their preference. You might see a rock chuck running on the hill. It might be a good sight in opportunity. Yeah. Next. That looks like a good group. Well, Gavin, day two has come to a close. Look at this setting. I mean, we're surrounded here How in the Pacific Northwest. We've got steel rock chuck targets everywhere. This is absolutely awesome. The stage is set. Now, tomorrow, the competitors are going to wake up, and they're going to have to have their mental game on. They're going to have to have their skills game on. This is going to be awesome. We are going to put them to work out here in this wilderness testing their skills at the Rock Chuck Olympics. It is gonna be great. Yes, in the next episode, the game is on. Next time on the Rock Chuck Olympics, we jump straight into the shooting stages, covering stage number one called Hidden Rock Chucks. This hunting-oriented stage will give the advantage to our hunters in the group, Adam Weiss from Hooty Hoo and Jim Farmer from Backfire, while stretching our competitive shooter skills outside of their comfort zone. Additional sponsors for the 2023 Rock Chuck Olympics include Long shot cameras, see your target without leaving your spot. Athlon optics, ridiculously good optics. Panic, superior firearms. Hornady ammunition, accurate, deadly, dependable.